Okay, everyone, welcome to our 11th Scalable Pandas Meetup. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, with, with two people that I um, really uh, know and, and respect. This will, this will be so much fun. So today we have Matt Harrison speaking and Doris Lee will, um, will give some sort of introductory contextualizing remarks that pave the way for Matt. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. So we'll just really quickly, quick, quickly um, recap the meetup goals. We'll do some group introductions, and then we'll um, have some context again for the tool. So it's Matt's going to use Pan, the Pandas API, but for the tool that's sort of undergirding what Matt's working on from Doris. Um, and then the main thing will be Matt's demo. And we could have called this lots of things um, because it's actually it's an end-to-end -end Python, a, a Pandas demo that focuses especially on time series functionality, um, but it's all being run on a database. And so it's kind of got those two elements to it today. Uh, both the sort of use case is exciting and, and Matt's an expert Pandas teacher, um, but also the, the, the underlying tech is exciting too. And then we'll have some moderated discussion and um, audience Q&A. Okay, so what are these meetups about? So we started these meetups. Um, these meetups are designed to tackle, to create uh, an, a forum where we can discuss Panda scale challenges. And that means both working with really large Pandas data frames um, but it also means working with very complex Pandas workflows. And our goal is to talk about use cases, um, tooling, lots of things surrounding this to, to make it easier for, um, for people to use Pandas in the enterprise. Who is Ponder? Ponder is the enterprise-ready Pandas company. And um, we're the primary maintainers of the open source, of the open source scalable drop-in replacement for Pandas, which is called Modin, uh, which has now over 8 million downloads. And, um, and then we'll talk more about the Ponder product uh, today and, and what that unlocks. Why did Ponder start these meetups? Our goal is to create a community around these Pandas scale questions. Um, but I think especially with this vision of having Pandas be a production ready tool. Um, too often Pandas is good for prototyping, but then the moment you have to do something like really substantial in Pandas, you, you, people start to, you know, you, you end up turning to other tools to work with really large data and, and so our goal is to get have pandas have um, a seat at the at the production table. How often will these be held? We hold these once a month, typically the fourth Thursday of every month. Though this month it's because we had a major launch a week ago, uh, we decided to move it to today. But we're anticipating having one um, at the end of this month. Um, and then how can you get involved? If you want to present, if you have a, a proposed topic for these meetups, um, please let us know. You can email me at peter at ponder peter at ponder io. Okay, I get to introduce um, Doris Lee and Matt Harrison. So Doris is the, the co-founder and CEO at Ponder. Um, Doris, before she came to Ponder, when she was doing her PhD at Berkeley, she was the uh, she authored the open source vis vis visualization package Lux, which is um, four and a half thousand stars on GitHub, and it's so cool. It has a semantic layer. You 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 state your intent, and then it proposes visualizations, a suite of visualizations that you pick from. Um, it's it's very cool, and then. Uh, we'll also get to hear from Matt. So Matt, I'm sure if you're here, probably you know who Matt is, but author of many Python data science books. Um, he wrote Effective Pandas, which I have sitting on my sitting on my desk. Um, corporate trainer, like long list of places he's done these trainings. So if you're in um, in search of uh, upskilling, you definitely reach out to Matt there. Um, and we're grateful to have Matt as an advisor for Ponder. And then most recently, he uh, his book he wrote Effective XG Boost came out a couple months ago, and um, and I just want to say, I actually, so I came here a year ago to Ponder as chief of staff, and Matt was an advisor here, but it turns out he's not the first Harris member of his family that I met, or I had heard about his son because his son goes to school with my niece. So I had heard stories before. And then when I finally came to Ponder and, and Matt was here, I was like, I was like, oh, this is the same Harrison family uh, um, that I've heard about from my niece, Mary. So anyway, really, really fun. Excited to hear from uh, Matt today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Doris to give some contextualizing remarks, and then she'll um, turn it over to Matt. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm super excited to uh, talk at the Scale of Pandas meetup today and uh, share a little bit more about uh, what we're doing at Ponder and also super excited about Matt's demo uh, after this. And so with that, um, uh, so I wanted to just give a very brief overview of like what we're doing at Ponder um, and essentially like with uh, our, our latest product, some of you might have seen uh, our, our public beta 
uh, launch blog post uh, over the past week. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is allowing you to run pandas on, on your data warehouse. And so uh, throughout the next like five minutes, I'm going to break this down into like, what exactly does that mean? Like, what exactly does running pandas on your da data warehouse mean? Um, and 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 show you a little bit about how you can incorporate this uh, in your own workflows. And so um, how exactly does Ponder work? So with Ponder, um, all you have to do is essentially uh, continue to use your like, um, you know, Python library, uh, your, your pandas, right? Uh, write code in pandas, numpy, and so on uh, in your own ID. So panda, uh, ponder is essentially uh, like a library that you can install on your own machines. And with that, like once you submit these queries, you, you run these queries, uh, ponder automatically translates these into SQL query for you. Um, and those SQL queries that ponder is generating, have generated, then runs on your database backend. And now that could be Snowflake, that could be DuckDB, that could be um, uh, BigQuery, and so on. And so all of the execution, all of the work that is done is being done on the database. And so you're probably here because you love pandas. Uh, it's probably why you're at this meetup. And this means that all of a sudden, instead of just like being able to write SQL queries to, to query your database, you're now opening up a whole new uh, set of APIs. You can write pandas queries against your databases uh, and so you have a much easier way of working with your data, uh, depending on like what you want to do. You can mix and mash, you know, your SQL queries with pandas um, and 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 so forth. Um, and oftentimes, and you, you'll actually see this in Matt's demo, there is things that are much, much easier to do uh, in, in pandas than, uh, than it is to write a, a giant long SQL queries. And so that's our goal with Ponder is to give you this pandas interface for your database. And so um, just as a bit of comparison, I wanted to kind of showcase what is the difference? What is the, the difference between uh, what we do with vanilla pandas uh, and what we do with uh, Ponder? And so if you recall, if you were in one of our earlier meetups, I think it was the first meetup that we had, we talked a little bit about the scalability challenges that people often face when using uh, pandas. And the, the source of this uh, ish, the, the source of this challenge, the reason why people have scalability challenges with pandas is because pandas is an in-memory data structure, right? So um, with pandas, all of your data needs to be in memory for you to be able to operate on it. So what that means in terms of if you have a database with all of your data in it is that you often have to fetch your data. So essentially you would run like pd.sql, uh, pd.readsql, and you would fetch all of your data, pull it into memory, pull it onto your own machines, um, and then operate it with it in memory. Now, if your database has like over a terabyte of data, obviously you don't have as much data in memory. So you often have to either like work with limited samples. You might have to like summarize your data or like aggregate it in a certain way and pull it in so that it's a smaller thing that fits in. Um, the other aspect that we see a lot in enterprises is that if you try to pull your data in into memory, into your own machine, that's actually not doable in a lot of cases when your data is, uh, for example, as sensitive data or you have uh, PII or, or this is very true in like healthcare or financial industries in particular. Um, and so you can't actually pull the data out of your database. And so a lot of times you can't, you simply can't use pandas on your database. And so with Ponder, what we're essentially saying is, hey, keep your data where, where, where we have your data in a database and you run these pandas queries directly on the database. And so this is a much easier way of productionizing and, and, and scaling your workflows. You no longer have to you know, set up a different infrastructure or set up a different stack just to run your pandas queries. Um, and then the best thing is that the data stays where, you, uh, where, where it lives, right? It never leaves the warehouse or your database. So it's a very secure way of working with your data. And so those are the kind of the key difference between what happens in vanilla pandas, which is an in-memory uh, data structure uh, versus what we're doing with Ponder, which really allows you to run your pandas queries within your, uh, directly in your database. And, and so the, the one thing that is interesting is that when you, when you think about the traditionally like the database world and the data science world, these are like two very different uh, distinct sort of worlds, right? 
Um, and, and pandas, on the other hand, is like one of the most popular data science libraries that you know we all love um, and love using. Um, and then databases is one of the most popular data infrastructures. And, and with what we're doing at Ponder, it's really bringing these two worlds together and bridging this gap uh, between sort of the data science world, the libraries that we use, and then giving, giving that interface to sort of the database. And, and so it's really, again, going back to the, the meetup title, uh, a pandas API for, for your database. Uh, and, and and with that, you inherit a lot of the benefits of security, scale, um, and, and reliability, all the great things that you get with a relational database or a data warehouse. And so um, I've talked a lot at, at a very high level about you know, what we do at Ponder, uh, you know, oh, what is Ponder, and how, how it uh, works at a very high level. Um, but maybe you're thinking like, hey, like how does this actually uh, fit into my workflow? Like, is it actually going to speed up my workflows or like allow me to work on much larger data? Like, uh, and, and so th those are maybe some of the questions that, that you have. And so I wanted to show some concrete numbers uh, that, and this is based on some of the benchmarks that we ran recently. Um, and so this first benchmark is essentially three different pandas queries. So you have our read CSV, uh, our read sample, and group by. So these are very common sort of data science uh, operations uh, in pandas that you would do. And essentially what we did here was we ran this uh, with ponder, which you can see in the light blue bars, and then pandas in the dark blue bars. Um, and then it's in particular with ponder, we're running this on DuckDB. So it's all happening on uh, a, a, in a local execution of DuckDB uh, running on, on a particular machine. And you can see that we vary the data set from like one gigabyte all the way up to 32 gigabytes. And we can see that as we scale, Pandas, uh, uh, Ponder is yielding uh, significant sort of benefits um, in terms of performance when it comes to these large scale data. So uh, data processing. So when you look at read CSV, uh, here we have pandas takes over like 700 seconds with ponder uh, it takes less uh, a little bit less than 200 seconds even with like something like resample um, again very uh, uh, operation that takes a really long time um, on 32 gigabytes of data with ponder it's much much faster and this is largely because we're leveraging duckdb as a backend um, and duckdb is uh, is kind of allows you to parallelize uh, sort of your queries. Uh, and so we can leverage that directly, very similar to how we leverage um, the scalability of different uh, data warehouses and different backends. And then the other thing to note is that with our public beta release last week, uh, you can actually do this now. You can try this uh, on your own right now. Uh, so running Ponder on DuckDB is completely free. Uh, you can actually get started today. Uh, I'll show you. Um, uh, in, in the next couple of slides, how you can get started. And so uh, if you have a Pandas workflow right now, maybe you're using a resample, maybe you're using group by or any of the common sort of data science uh, Pandas operations that you're using, you can get this level of speed up uh, today with, with Ponder. And so the second example I wanted to showcase is a bit of a, mo a bo more realistic workflow where we have a bunch of queries, we're doing an end-to-end -end data science workflow where we load in two tables, we're doing things like describe, merge. Um, we have a little bit more detail in our blog post uh, and, and video, which I, I'm happy to send a link to after this. Um, but you can see we're doing resample, group by, and so on. So this is the end-to-end -end workflow. And for every single query in this notebook that we have, we're, we're timing it and we're seeing what is the uh, performance uh, with pandas and what is the performance with ponder on snowflake and this is a, a, a table with over 150 million rows uh, in snowflake um, and you can see that this the speed up here is, is very very significant right like um, all of these these operations are taking you know anywhere from like 15 minutes to even like uh, almost 30 minutes uh, with pandas it takes seconds. It takes less than a minute for all of these operations uh, with Ponder on Snowflake. And so you can see that with the end-to-end -end data science workflow, uh, if you were running something like this in Pandas uh, on 150 million rows, 
it would take something like two hours to run. Uh, with Ponder, it's simply like a minute on on um, and you're keeping the exact same code, which means that you don't have to actually do any refactoring uh, to get this level of uh, you know performance improvement. And this is a huge win, right? Like if you are uh, someone who's in a notebook, a lot of the times you're doing EDA, you're doing uh, exploratory sort of work. You don't want to wait for like two hours for these operations to run. Like you want to be able to iterate very quickly. And so with Ponder, like because the end-to-end -end workflow only takes a minute, it means you can iterate on the workflow a lot more. In fact, like this workflow runs like 76x faster than the other one, which means that all of this time that you have in between, you can try out different models. You could uh, test out different like hyperparameters, pre-processing, all the stuff that you can do with pandas, um, you can you can iterate much faster with um, with Ponder. And so again, Ponder reduces these hour long workflows um, and really bringing that down to minutes so that you can really focus on uh, experimenting and working with your data, um, as well as like if you have long running data pipelines. Um, we can also kind of speed that up with Ponder. Cool. And so in the in the final uh, in my final slide, I just wanted to also kind of mention that uh, since last week we have our public beta announcement, which means that anyone um, anyone here today, anyone um, any of your colleagues can now go and sign up and try Ponder for free today. And so you can go to app.ponder.io slash sign up to create an account. And then once you create an account, you'll actually get a product access key. Um, and with that product access key, you can just do pip install Ponder on your own machines, on your own um, you know, system, uh, wherever you're using like Python and Pandas. It, you just pip install the package, enter that product key, and you can get going. And you can start running your Python data workflows um, in, your, in your data warehouse today. And if you need some additional information to get started, uh, we have a quick start guide. It takes five minutes to get started. Um, so definitely go and check this out uh, after, after the, the meetup. Um, and so with that, uh, I wanted to hand it over to Matt. Um, uh, so Matt is going to showcase uh, Pandas for Finance demo um, using a lot of the operations that we talked about earlier, like resample, rolling. So I'm super excited for Matt's demo. Um, Matt, do you want to... Share. I'll stop screen sharing, and I think you can share. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks Thanks for letting me hop on here. Thanks, Doris. That was awesome. Um, really cool what, what you guys are doing, and I'm excited uh, to be uh, to, to see where this goes. Um, awesome. So, uh, yeah, I'm Matt. Uh, happy, happy to be here. If you've got questions, uh, feel free to throw those in the chat if you want to. Also, um, I, I'm happy if you want to vocalize them as well. Um, I know if you turn on your, your camera, you can raise your hand if you want to, but otherwise, um, uh, yeah, ha happy to uh, address questions as they come up. So I'm, I'm going to go over just a, a basic data set that um, I was interested in. Um, which was, you know, a, a, a few months ago when banks started failing that uh, caused a lot of people some concern and kept them up at night. And so I thought it might be interesting to uh, look at some of the data around that and see how frequent these, these bank failures actually, uh, how frequently they occur. So the U.S. government has some data on this, and, and I went to this uh, website, FDIC, and uh, grabbed some data here. Now, I'll, I'll just walk through my analysis of, of what I'm doing here, um, but I, I, um, I, I want you to realize that um, this is all going to look like Pandas code, so everyone here who's familiar with Pandas, this code should look familiar to you. Um, however, I, I'm not using Pandas directly, right? I'm using the Pandas API. Um, so I've got a few imports here, uh, importing uh, JSON here that I've got credentials stored in a JSON file. Um, so Ponder uh, leverages the Modin library to get that Pandas interface. So uh, that's where the PD is coming from, Modin. I'm importing Ponder and, and then I, I'm actually connecting to Snowflake to do this. So after I've imported these, I'm gonna uh, initialize Ponder and load my credentials and connect to Snowflake. 
And let's uh, see if this works. Okay, it looks like the demo gods are cooperating with me. Okay, so, so at this point, it's going to look very similar uh, to your normal pandas workflow here. So I'm, I'm just going to read uh, this table here, which is the bank failure table. And when I do that, I have a data frame come out of this. And this, again, is not on my machine. This is living in Snowflake here. And so this particularly isn't a ton of data here, um, but uh, again, I'm not running it locally. It is running in Snowflake. So, so this is the, the, the raw data that I, that I downloaded from the, the government website. You know, generally, uh, some of you who might have you know, read my book or have been through maybe some of my courses have seen that like, I like to take that raw data and just clean it up a little bit. And so I'm not, I'm not gonna walk through the whole process that I did, but um, I, I, I did make this little chain here to clean this up. So, so let's just walk through what this is doing here. Um, this is, so, so I'm gonna call this tweak bank uh, function here. It's gonna take uh, my raw data that I loaded here. And then I, I've got some chained operations here. So the first one here is I'm going to make a column called fail date. And uh, there's actually already a column called fail date, but it, I'm going to convert it into a date. So we're going to use PD2 date time. And again, this is happening uh, on the database, right? It's not happening locally here. Um, and then we've got this city ST uh, string here, which is uh, this uh, column right here. This is actually two pieces of data, uh, data scientists kind of like to spread apart those those two pieces of data, right? So I'm gonna just use a, a string operation on that. I'm gonna split that and pull off the first part and, and set that as the city and the second part as the state. So now I should have two new columns after doing that. Um, at this point, I'm going to drop the city state column here. And then I, I've got a rename here just to, to make my columns maybe a little bit more uh, intelligible here. So I'm just going to use this mapping up here to rename my columns. So again, we'll run this here and this will give me back this uh, new data frame here. And maybe we'll do a describe on this just to, to get some summary statistics. So one time I was teaching a, a class and I, I showed some people describe and someone went like, like they were swatting a fly on their head or something after I, I said that. And I, I said, what, what's wrong? Did I say something wrong? And they're like, no. We just spent the last three weeks implementing this for a business intelligence solution, right? And if we had we had known that like with one line of code, we could do that, um, that would have saved us a lot of time, right? So, so the, here's your summary statistics here, um, again, from, from the data warehouse. Now, uh, you know, is, is it hard to maybe get uh, the minimum and maximum from uh, SQL? Now, it's not particularly hard, right? Uh, and, you know, with a little bit of elbow grease, you can get standard deviation and mean. Um, but to get them for all the numeric columns, as well as these other summary statistics, is kind of painful. And actually, uh, if, if you go into like Snowflake, you can ask Snowflake, uh, what, what are the queries that were run? And so I, I've actually pulled out the query that was run for describe here. So I'm just going to sort of scroll through this. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, I'm still scrolling. Okay. And still scrolling. I think we'll get to the end here soon. Okay. Uh, ho hopefully you get the picture. Th this is this is what um, is running behind the scenes to get... Um, to, to get that describe output here. Now, now, admittedly, there is some of this that, that is to maintain uh, compliance, to, to make it look and behave like pandas, but there, there is also like, this isn't, you know, some, you know, what I asked ChatGBT, like emulate this, write me a SQL query that does describe like pandas. I, I don't know that ChatGPT can currently do that. Um, I mean, it might be able to do one of those, but like, for all the numeric columns and do that. Uh, not, not really something that AI is going to do for us right now. Um, so that, that is, I mean, in and of itself, like this functionality would have been a lifesaver for my client uh, had they had that, they could have just plugged that right in and, and got these answers. So here's a data dictionary. I'm not really gonna go over this too much per se. Um, I, I mean, we'll make this notebook available later if you want to like scroll through it here, but basically, 
Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at failures by year. So, so in, in our data frame here, we, we do have this effective date. Again, this is this column that I, I pulled out and we converted it to a date time. So, uh, you know, once, once you have things converted to date times in pandas, you can, you can do some cool things with them. Like, um, you can say like DT and, and then you can say like, what's the month on this? Right, um, and, and this is like, you know, could you write code to do this? Yeah, I mean, if this was left as a string, this would be kind of annoying. It would be like a regular expression, but you know, once you convert this to a, a proper date type, you get this really nice functionality in, in uh, pandas that makes your life really easy. So if we wanna look at like failures by year, I'm gonna do a group by here and I'm gonna say, let's group by the year and then we'll just take the size of each of those groups. And, and when you run that, we get back, it looks like a pandas series, but again, this is running in the database. In the index here, uh, we have the years and then uh, for each year, we have the count uh, of the failures there. <clears throat> um, so, so one of the things I like to do is I like to, to tack on a visualization. I mean, th th this number is okay, but humans aren't really optimized for looking at just, you know, a table of data. And pandas makes it really easy. I know some of you said like your favorite thing to do is tack on a, a plot onto this. Uh, and, and so, yeah, if you know how how pandas makes plotting, I, I think pandas is, is a better interface for matplotlib than matplotlib is. Uh, so uh, I can say uh, dot plot dot bar, and what that's going to do is it's going to take the index and put that in the x axis, and then for every value here, since this is a series, uh, at, at each of these points, it's going to draw a bar. And when we do that, we get something that looks like this. Okay, and, and so there's a, a, a decent visualization. Uh, um, now, it, it is a little bit hard to read here, like the dates are overlapping. And, and th this is actually, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna rant for a little bit. Th this, this is um, a, a design choice that the Pandas folks made and, and ponder because they're implementing the Pandas API, uh, trying to implement it bug for bug. Um, follow suite here, but um, when you do a bar plot in, in pandas, it treats whatever's in the axis as a categorical, which I kind of don't like that in case I want to do a, a bar plot with a date that's in the index, it converts those dates to categorical. So we can't really take advantage of matplotlib's uh, formatting for a time series in, in that there. Um, so, you know, we'll just contrast there with just saying a normal plot right there. And if we do a normal plot, it doesn't convert to a categorical and you do get that. I mean, you can get around this by like piping out to pipe and then using matplotlib to, to call bar on that under the covers. But there we go, there, there is our failures over time. And you can see that like, you know, our bank failures, um, uncommon it doesn't look like they particularly are like through through the 80s and 90s it looks like there's a whole whole uh large occurrence of those bank failures and then uh back around uh the 2008 crisis there's some some failures again so so this is not particularly something that's novel um but apparently it sort of comes in waves at least this visualization seems to indicate that to me this is one of the reasons I like visualizations. They can tell a completely different story than like this table of data, data up here. I mean, it's it, looking at this table data, you know, it's numbers here, but th this, this tells a story. And if you add on some annotations on top of this, you know, you can say like, okay, here's, uh, you know, the, the 2008 baking crisis, right, which caused this. And I don't know uh, what caused uh, these failures back here um, prior to 1940, but, you know, easily, pretty easy to tell a story from this visualization. Now, um, this is by year, but uh, because we have date information and pandas makes it relatively easy to uh, manipulate uh, by different frequencies, we, we can use this resample here. So, so I'm, I'm actually going to comment out this chain. We'll just sort of walk through this here. Um, so, so here's our original data. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, set uh, the index to the effective date. And in pandas, when you stick the date into the index, that allows you to leverage this resample method here. So resample is kind of lazy. It doesn't do much. Uh, you pass in what's called an offset alias in here. 
And this alias, in this case, M, says we want to resample this at the month level. Well, it doesn't resample until you give it an aggregation. And so the aggregation we want to do is the size aggregation. Okay, and so now when we run this, um, you, you can see that in the index here, we have the month, and then for each month, we have the, the size, how many failures there were at that. And the, the cool thing about this is that in the index here, this is a date. And so if we were to plot this, um, we, you know, we, we can uh, get, you know, in this case, map plot, but we get the, this nice uh, plotting here. Now, you know, is this the world's greatest plot? Um, I mean, this is, this is telling basically the same story as this, but whereas this is aggregated at the year level, uh, this is aggregated at the month level. And, and sometimes when you aggregate things at a fine level like this, you, you, you get these sort of fuzzy lines here. They kind of look like caterpillars sometimes. Um, but th this, this tells sort of a different story here where you see like, okay, there was some peak uh, somewhere around like 1988 or so, right? Um, but then uh, around that, it sort of tapered off some. Um, so, so maybe we, uh, let me show you some techniques that I like to use uh, to smooth these out. Okay, there's a there question or comment. Kirill said maybe Great Depression before World War II. Um, yeah, again, I, I'm not a banking expert. I, that could have been, you know, uh, Great Depression. Um, I, th I think that's a, a probably. I mean, if you think about this, this is probably 1930. So, so you know, fallout from Great Depression, um, and probably this data came about, about because of the Great Depression. I mean, that's probably when like Peter or someone else who's who's more knowledgeable could probably give in, input on that. Um, but I, I'm going to show some 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 things I like to do if I see a plot that looks like this. Um, uh, how I might smooth this out. Um, so, so Adrian says, does Modin work with Plotly? So um, it should. I, I haven't tried it, but I, I imagine it should. Um, um, yeah, it does work with Plotly. I was just going to send a link uh, of an example um, that it works with Plotly. Okay. Thanks, Doris. <clears throat> okay, so um, I, I'm going to do another example here. Um, I, I'm going to try and smooth this out, right? So, so there are these bumps here, and th this makes it, it one of the things you can do is you can zoom into this. We can say, like, I want to zoom in from like 1930 to 1945 and sort of see what's going on that. And, and it's actually relatively easy to do that with loc here. But another thing you might want to do is just sort of smooth this out. This is a common operation that, uh, particularly like during COVID, you saw this a lot where you would have uh, daily reports on like deaths or infections uh, at like the state level or, or at a country level for COVID reporting. And then some of those would be kind of jagged depending on how they measured these things. But the visualization people would then go, go over that and put, okay, we got the daily data. Then they would put a weekly rolling average line on top of that, to sort of smooth that out and let you see the trend. So let's see if we can do something similar here uh, with pandas. So I'm, I'm gonna say, okay, here, here's my chain down here. Uh, we got our bank and we're gonna stick effective date into the index here, but now we're gonna call pipe. Okay, and pipe is this fun little method here that uh, basically allows you to do kind of whatever you want. And I'm going to pass in a function called plot monthly and yearly into that. So uh, the pipe, the function that you pass in the pipe just has to take like the data frame as the first parameter and it can return whatever it wants. In this case, I'm returning the data frame so I can continue to chain after that if I want to. Uh, but inside of here, um, note I'm also passing in a map plot of access that I created up above here. What I'm going to do is I have a little chain up here that says, okay, you've got this data frame, uh, resample it to the month level, pull out the size, and then plot the monthly level there, and then do another one, resample it at the year level, pull out the size, and plot that as the annual level, and then also stick a legend on that. And so let's run that. And, and note that the output here, I mean, the output of this cell is actually this, right? This uh, data frame, which is, is the, what pipe is returning. Um, but if you scroll down a little bit, you can see that here is the plot that Matt Plotlove created, right? And so we got, we got two uh, lines here. The blue one is our monthly data. And then we've got this orange line, which, which is just summing each of those 
uh, values up at a year level, right? So, so you do see uh, basically the same information represented at a different granularity. And, and so again, you can see like, you know, during uh, 1935 to 1945, we had a little hump here. Another one starting at 1980 uh, to 1995 or so. And then another one starting around 2008 or so. And, um, you know, it looks like it had ripple effects until uh, 2015 or so. And, and you can see that, you know, there is value at, at that granularity, change that granularity to an annual granularity, sort of lets you see at the high level what's going on there and see more of the signal than the noise. And it, the nice thing is that this is super easy to do with pandas, right? I mean, I'm literally changing one letter here and I get that functionality kind of for free. And and again, because uh, I, I mean, because we're, we're leveraging Ponder here, you can do this on on your on your data sitting in your data warehouse, which is you know uh, the ability to do this is is super powerful. Um, you know, I, I would personally not want to be writing SQL to do this, um, but. Um, you know, people have different things that they like to do. Some people do like to do SQL. And, and I'm not saying that you should never write SQL, but, um, you know, if you can operate at a higher level that gives you more functionality, um, I, I think that's one of the ways, you know, people often talk about this 10x developer, you know, how can I be a 10x developer? And if you can write something like you can write describe, then one line of code is going to give you 100 lines plus of SQL or even more. Um, yeah, that that can that can push you, you know, towards, you know, being a lot more productive here. Um, let's look at another way to do this. Um, let, let's say I want to group by and now I'm going to group by uh, two things. I'm going to group by the month and the resolution. So, you know, what happened? How, how did these uh, bank failures uh, get resolved? And when I do this, um, because I did a group by with multiple items in there, um, I get a, a series that comes out looking like this. Uh, and so we have a hierarchical or multi-index here. At the outer level, we have uh, the month saying effective date here. And at the inner level of the index, we have this resolution. Um, and um, okay, so, so th this again is a table that is somewhat interesting. Um, however, if, if you look at this, it, it's uh, aggregating this at, for every month from like 1935 to 2020 and putting every month in there. And maybe I don't want every month. I actually want every month from 1935, not the aggregate of the months. And so uh, the way to do that is to use PD grouper here. Um, and, and this is similar to using resample here, but the difference here is because we're saying group by, we can pass in PD grouper, uh, we can actually do a grouping uh, with multiple hierarchy, with a hierarchy in here that we couldn't get with resample. So we get a little bit more power than we would get with resample right here. Um, and, and so here is uh, the result of that. And again, this is, um, in the, this case, is a series. And, and so again, uh, this table of data is not particularly, uh, you know, in and of itself, kind of hard to, to see. So let's let's stick this a plot, okay? And so again, we need to remember what plot does. Once you understand how plot works in pandas, it makes it really easy to uh, to visualize these things. So we're gonna, we're going to do plot here, and remember what plot does is it takes the index and sticks it in the x-axis. Well, in this case, the index is a multi-index or a hierarchical index. So it's got two values here. In this case, it's got like. Uh, April 30th with failure in it. So, so let's plot this and see what happens when we do this. And um, if you look at, at this, this plot, it's a little uh, not satisfying because uh, what, what's going on here is it's taking that multi-index and pulling out the values of that as a, a tuple and, and, and writing each tuple there. So that's probably not what we want here. And, and generally, uh, when I have like multi-indexes or hierarchical columns, uh, I, I try and flatten them because it makes my life easier. So, so let's see how we could flatten this. Um, so again, this is what we had before. I'm just going to throw in a comment here. This was my chain before here. 
Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this unstack here. This unstack is an operation that's a little bit brain bending, like the first time you see it. But once, once you get used to it, it, it comes in super handy. So I'm going to say unstack level one. So that's the in, level one, level zero is the outer level one. Level one is this inner level here. And so what this is going to do is it's going to take this resolution index and it's going to flip it up into uh, columns here. Okay, and so that, that looks something like this. Um, there is a, a prefix on there. I, I'm told that um, that's going to be uh, addressed in, in a up and coming version of Ponder. But um, uh, I'll just fix that with, with this little fixed columns here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say unstack this and then um, I'll, I'll just walk through my chain here. One of the nice things about these chains is like, you can just comment them out and then sort of run through them. So this is our unstacked version. I'm gonna fill in the missing values here with zero because there, there isn't anything there. And then I'm gonna say rename, fix that column, which you get rid of the reduced here. And then at this point, I'm gonna call plot. Okay, so so again, what does plot do? <clears throat> what does plot do? It's gonna take my index, put it in the x-axis. And then in this case, I've got uh, multiple columns or series. Each of these will be its own line. Okay, and there we go. Uh, so we have you know, the ones that uh, had failure and the ones that had assistance, and, and we got a visualization of those. And it looks like um, you know, these assistant ones kind of only occurred uh, you know, during the 80s and 90s. It, that, that was sort of when they occurred. Uh, so, so, so I think this plot is pretty telling, right? I, I mean, it tells us a different story than we would get otherwise. And, and uh, I mean, you, you could write this as one line of code. I wrote it as multiple lines of code just because it's easier to understand that way. But like um, with relatively little amount of code, I can get some pretty big insights into here. Now, again, I do see sort of this caterpillar fuzzy action going on here. So one thing I might want to do is do a rolling average on this. So I'm going to say uh, this is the month frequency, but I'm going to do a 12-month a rolling average here. And so what that's going to do when I plot that so this is just going to smooth that out, right? And now this lets me basically see the trends. This is this again is like that trick that I said that uh, a lot of people are doing during COVID, where they would have the daily data, which which would look sort of like this, a little bumpy, and then they would smooth it out with a seven day rolling average to get the weekly. In this case, I've got I'm going from the monthly data into the and and doing a yearly uh, 12, uh, uh, 12 month rolling average here to get sort of what those year. Uh, uh, trends look like. And again, you can see that like, okay, um, you know, the blue line is only occurring during, it looks like the decade of the 80s or so. Okay. Um, and again, here's just our, our, we can contrast that, like up here, we're doing a, a monthly aggregation, right? Here, we're doing the monthly with the 12 month, ro 12 month rolling, and here's just a yearly aggregation. Right, and so these basically give you uh, kind of the same information, but uh, you know, you really easy to go from one to the other if you want to. Um, I I kind of do like that rolling, um, but you, sometimes you have to play with like what that window looks like, and and sometimes you know it might make sense. Um, I'm going to show one more example here, just. Um, you know, what these bank failures look like over time uh, with, with these transaction types. So, so these are the resolutions over time. And so here I'm just saying, let's group by month. And we're also gonna group by this transaction type, which, which if you look at the data, the data, diction, data dictionary, that, that is the resolution type. And, um, and otherwise this looks very similar to what I had up here. I just changed from resolution uh, to, to this transaction type. And uh, you can see sort of like how how did they deal with these banks over time and what were the different uh, sorts of resolutions that they did. And you can see, for example, like th this pink one, which is PNA, was, was common earlier. Uh, it looks like as of recently, this gray one is, is one that's more common, uh, the, just PA. And then like during the 80s and 90s, you see this red one sort of stick out, this IDT, and you can go up to the date. <clears throat> data dictionary and sort of dive into that and see what's going on there. Okay. Um, so, so that that is my demo here. Um, again, what, what I hoped to uh, show you is that um, 
there, there's a lot of rich time series functionality in the pandas API. Um, and generally when you're, when, you know, your boss or someone asks you for something, they're asking for an aggregation. Uh, you know, it, I like to say, you know, Im imagine you're running a candy store and the boss says, uh, you know, I, I want to know how we're doing. They're, they don't want to know that Billy came in and bought a lollipop and a Tootsie Roll and then Sally came in and bought a piece of licorice and, and a bubble gum. They want to know 58 people came in and they bought $2,028 worth of stuff, right? So, so you, you want to aggregate those values. And so these group by operations go hand in hand with aggregations to allow us to tell a story over time. So, so uh, um, I think, you know, once you get around, uh, once you have the basic knowledge of pandas, you want to start moving into these more powerful operations where you start to get these aggregations, because those tend to be the answers that people want to see. Uh, again, these are super powerful in pandas and ponder. I, I kind of shown you sort of like actually pretty basic ones or actually a lot more complicated ones that we can do. Um, and then you can combine these with visualization, right? And it makes it really easy. You just tack on a plot. And if you understand how that visualization works, that generally if you're doing a bar plot or a line plot, you're going to put the x axis, the index and the x axis. Uh, it makes it really easy to sort of, okay, I've got these tools for pandas. Let's make a visualization that helps me tell my story and explain it to my boss. Uh, and then I think this is just awesome. Like, like I said, you know, going back to my client hitting themselves in the head with Ponder, you can leverage this power of an API that's, I, I think, a lot more powerful than you get with, I mean, can you do this with SQL? Certainly you can, and Ponder's built on top of SQL, right? But I don't want to write that SQL. I would rather uh, write the same code that I'm, I'm comfortable, that gives me a lot more flexibility and power uh, with less lines of code than SQL. So, so Ponder is giving us that on top of the data warehouse, which, which is incredible. Okay, um, that's what I've got here. Um, okay, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think we... Um, we start a little late. We have a few more minutes for questions. If people need to drop, they can drop. But I have I have a bunch of questions that I'm very eager to ask. So uh, selfishly, I and and people in the audience, this is your moment. If you um, if you want to ask questions, you are able to ask questions. You can either do them in chat or raise your hand, and we'll call on you. Okay. So Matt, I so you're a Ponder advisor, and there are not a lot of moments, but some moments where I'm writing pandas code for Ponder. I'm I was a data scientist before. I don't write a ton of code now, but sometimes it happens. I will admit, I am often afraid you will see my pandas code and that something I'm doing will give away my level of pandas ability. And it makes me think about, um, I, re I read this book where there are these things called indicator plants, where you see a plant and you, based on the nature of the plant, where conditions can survive in, you can infer stuff about the soil. So like they survive in just a very narrow band of pH, for example. You're like, ah, that plant's there. Now I know something about this hillside. The soil yeah, has your code is weedy. Is that what you're yes, saying? So, so I just imagine you looking at my code and being like, ah, Peter's somewhere between beginner and intermediate, and these are the giveaways. I'm curious, like, what are for you some giveaways when you look at code? Maybe you're doing a training at a place and you quickly want to assess like how advanced to go with your training. What are the kinds of things you look to to be like, oh, this person's you know, it's very honorable to be a beginning pandas user. That's fine. But, you know, that's where they are. Oh, this person's kind of intermediate. Oh, this person's fairly advanced. What are those, for you, those indicators? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, first of all, I would say uh, th this is a, th this tendency to, like, associate yourself with your code is, is, is probably a bad thing. I don't mean to get, like, all meta here. But, um, you know, when I'm teaching a course, I try and say, like, instead of, like, one of the things we do is we do labs and then we like have people share their code and we sort of tear them apart for better or for worse. I try and say like, okay, instead of like, this is your code and I'm looking at you, let's sort of like put your code here and you're here and we're both looking at your code, right? And, and so I think you need, first of all, separate yourself from your code. Um, your code, even though it took a lot of sweat and tears to make, it's not your baby, it's not you. Um, I would think that most people would want to learn how to do things in a, a better, more effective way. Um, so anyway, having said that, um, some some of the things I see, I see a lot of apply, um, apply. So so again, you have to understand like how pandas and these things work. Is is Python is kind of a slow language, but we're pushing things into a faster layer, right? And so in the case of uh, like Ponder, it's pushing it into the database to do that. In the case of like uh, 
pandas, it's pushing it basically into this NumPy or with pandas too, it's this Py arrow a, a interface for doing that. So when you're when you're using something like apply, generally you're you're crossing that barrier and you're getting slow code, right? And then so part of the reason we want to use these libraries is, is they give us a, a good API and do things at a fast level. Um, another thing that I see that um, is kind of a telltale giveaway is, is like using for loops. So once you're starting to work uh, with tabular data, we, we want to start thinking in a more of a vectorized way, which is kind of weird for some people when they never really had that. They're used to more programming and, and looping over things. But generally, pandas and friends are going to give you ways to do uh, these operations in a vectorized uh, manner that's quicker than a for loop. Um, and, and then, I, I mean, I have a whole bunch of opinions about things like chaining and that. And I get that, like, you know, if you want to get like social media posts, all you have to do is, is uh, throw up a, a, a piece of code sort of. I mean, if, if I threw up one of these last pieces of code that had, you know, eight lines of chains, people would go berserk on, <laughs> on, on social media. Um, and, and so my advice there, that, I mean, that seems to be super controversial to people, but it, the weird thing is like people will write SQL and they'll write like 50 lines of SQL and, and no one cares. Um, so I think it's weird that like SQL gets a pass there, but like code doesn't. Anyway, my advice there is, is like try out chain, right? And, and I've written pandas in like the, I would say the old school way where it's like, I'm going to do one thing, make an intermediate variable, store it in a cell, then make another cell and change things. And, and then I have like 50 cells of all these things that are like intermediate variables that I don't really care about. The thing that I care about is like the end result, right? And I'm actually using that chain and debugging that chain as I'm going. A lot of people think that like, I have this big chain and I just sort of threw it out there. I don't throw it out there. I like, as I'm going, I'm adding one line at a time and sort of debugging that and stepping through it, right? But um, yeah, I would say, you know, if chaining like causes like this gag in your mouth reaction to you, my advice would be try it out, see it, see if you like it. I find that most people, it actually helps them. Yeah, okay, that's awesome. And I will say um, of the things you presented today, the one, like I've read a number of things you've written. One thing that was really helped me to see you do live was commenting and uncommenting out portions of the chaining. like. I don't know. That sounds obvious, but I just hadn't. It hadn't yeah. quite occurred to me that each yeah. of those, each of those, you can display those intermediate steps, and like that makes chaining. Yeah. I, I can now see it's much more doable than I had than I had realized. Yeah. Um, if you want the intermediate step, yeah, you can just comment it out and look at that, right? Alternatively, like you can inject a pipe, and in pipe you can actually put a function that will stick in the current state into a data into a global variable using globals. Um, if you really do want the interme intermediate state there. But yeah, a lot of people think that like, I just make this chain out of nowhere, there's a big chain, right? But I'm actually developing it as I go along. But then, uh, you know, for like presentations like this, I'll comment it back up and then uncomment it showing like the steps, what I would do as I was developing it. And um, and this, I was a data science intern at Core a, a, a while ago. And I actually have the feedback at my like mid- internship evaluation that I should do more in SQL and less in pandas specifically because of this. They were like, the SQL is much more, it's tighter. So I can like glance at the large SQL thing and know what's going on. Whereas if I have to trace through different cells, what's happening anyway. So I do think for readability it, back then I could have, you know, sort of dealt with that criticism yeah. by, by using, by using chaining. It seemed, uh, it, I mean, one, one thing that I, I would say is that a lot of content or, or media on, on social, you know, on, on blogs or whatnot is around, here's 20 things that you should do with pandas or those sorts of things, which tend to get uh, hits and links, right? And it's all operations in isolation. Like you can do value counts or you can do a filter or you can see what's missing, right? But I generally, when I'm dealing with client data or whatnot, it's not clean and I don't do one thing in isolation. I'm, I have a bunch of tools and I'm applying all of these tools to them, right? And, and so I think uh, part of this uh, confusion is a lot of people just see things in isolation. So I think, okay, I need to have one cell and this one cell does one thing, right? Where in, in, in practice, I think that ends up getting more in the way than helping. Um, if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, feel free to ask. Um, but I, I have one more that I would like to ask before we we close. But again, any audience members who want to ask, please go ahead. I um, 
So today our funder CTO gave a presentation at Rev4, the Domino Data Labs conference in New York. And he was talking about, um, um, he was talking about decoupling. Well, he's talking about how we now have storage and compute have been decoupled now in a lot of tech stacks. But he talks about how the API and the, and, and the compute are still coupled, meaning you have to use a certain API with, in a certain system. And he feels like, and kind of ponder, obviously we're moving this direction, we're trying to push this forward. Sort of the next generation is decoupling those two things, compute and the API. So eventually you can have a separate API, separate compute, separate storage. I'm curious to hear like your thoughts on that and, and kind of your thoughts for pandas over the next several years. Um, like, will it persist mostly at the API level? Do you think, no, no, it's gonna be, you know, the whole Pandas package as is, like with the Arrow stuff, you know, Pandas 3.0, that will probably be the default, just a lot of Arrow things. I'm curious to hear your your thoughts on on, on that. Yeah, I, I mean, you we can, we can sort of take SQL as one example where like SQL has been somewhat standardized and, and you, you, it isn't hard or too hard to say, here's some SQL that works on MySQL. I'm going to make it work on maybe Redshift or, or some other uh, backend, right? Um, I mean, the Pandas API hasn't been standardized per se, but I mean, Modin and, and Ponder are kind of doing that, but you can also see that uh, Dask is sort of doing that, Vex, um, QDF is doing that. And, and so it, it seems to me that like the Python uh, data community has somewhat standardized on, on Pandas and the Pandas API as sort of a way for manipulating data. Um, I, I actually would really love to see there be like an effort to like standardize this, right? Where it's like uh, this API, uh, there, there's nothing that's really Pythoning. It doesn't have to be Python necessarily, right? Um, so I, I think, but it, like having described is a lot better than writing a hundred lines of SQL to do that. So personally, I think it would be great to have like a standardization on that, um, that and that would allow some decoupling of compute. Um, you know, and there's a question here from Joram about like pullers, pullers gaining attraction. Um, I think pullers, Pullers has an advantage and it's sort of like we can learn from the mistakes of pandas. Um, and, and so, yeah, does pandas have some rough edges? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would think that the people from Ponder can actually point to a lot of those rough edges because they've re-implemented them um, to, to give you that API compatibility there. Um, you know, what pullers, uh, I, I mean, pullers, if, if you're starting from scratch and you're on smallish data, I mean, pullers might be good for you. Um, I've uh, done some work with pullers. I think pullers is actually um, more verbose than pandas for a lot of things, and, and it's not the same API. Um, and, and you don't have a scale out story that you have with pandas right now with pullers. Um, that being said, like, uh, using like pon could ponder like take the pullers API and uh, adapt it so you could get scale out with pullers using like ponder yeah certainly something like that could happen um, using like the technology that uh, um, ponder has um, so I, I so from my point of view I, I it looks like you know pandas as of now is a great place to be like you have all this compatibility with it with tools like uh, ponder you get scale out if you want to um i i think it's it's a great um choice for for people who are working with data um you kind of have to like if you're using something else you kind of have to sell me and it seems like the the, the main uh things that people want to use in, instead of, of, of pandas these days, or maybe something like pullers for small data because they might get some speed up. Um, you know, a speed up of, you know, going from like five seconds to three seconds, um, you know, that's maybe not super important for me. Um, but, you know, you depending on your workload, you might get to bigger speed ups with, with that. Um, the SQL side, again, I've written a lot of SQL in my life. I mean, I actually wrote a library very similar to Pandas back in the mid-2000s for, for doing uh, 
materialization of uh, uh, reporting uh, on on database uh, on SQL backends. Um, I, 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 I don't want to write SQL if, if I can get away with it. Um, I just find, you know, some things are nice in SQL, but a lot of things, it, it's, it just feels like it's a little antiquated and, and kind of gets in my way. And, and so I, I'd rather write it in code uh, than SQL. So, um, okay, so, so we did get some questions coming in here. Maybe um, I'll go through these, Pete. You can cut me off if we need, if we're running short on time. Uh, Adrian says, my way of writing pandas is, is to write classical pandas with a bit of chaining, then rewrite in a chained way. It'd be super interesting to see how Matt develops a chain from, from zero. Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I do, like I sell a bunch of pandas courses, Adrian, where, where I sort of walk through that. But again, uh, if, you, if you look at my chains generally, you can sort of reverse engineer them. I'm just going to go through uh, from start to scratch. But I, I guess you know if you're if you're writing in the classical way, um, my advice would be like you know just put parentheses around it and just try and like start chaining it. Generally, that I, I think one of the big things that people need to be aware of is like how to use a sign. Uh, I think a lot of people aren't aware of a sign, and once you kind of are comfortable with the sign, a lot of things. Uh, can be chained relatively easily. Uh, let me let me also say this. Um, a lot of people think that like I'm like you have to chain everything. Um, you don't have to chain everything, and there's some things that don't really make sense to be chained. And we actually saw that like one of my examples when I plotted something that was grouping at the year level, another thing at the at the month level. I did two different plots. Um, those. Uh, weren't really chained. It was two different calls, right? And so I'm not saying that like you have to chain everywhere, but a lot of places I think chaining will uh, make your life easier. Um, okay, Mahesh says within Python, one standardization attempt is the interchange protocol. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is the data frame protocol, which is good for like, yeah, if you want to like plot and you have something that implements the data frame protocol, you can do that. I'm talking more about the API about, you know, uh, is describe a standard API, right? Uh, sort of like SQL uh, has, has standards. Um, to me, that that might seem interesting. Um, but again, uh, you could see like that that distinction between compute and API. If, if that's important, right, and, and you don't want to have to rewrite your code every time, uh, having a standard is is really compelling for businesses to write to a standard. Um, and, and right now, for better, for worse, uh, sort of pandas is that standard. Okay. Um, okay, Kirill asked, do you plan to implement helper functions um, around, around, okay, and Doris answered, that okay yeah so awesome um i think i think we got through all the questions here so yeah, yeah thanks everyone yeah matt thank you so much doris thank you so much for presenting and to all those who um who came we'll, we'll post this to the website soon and and also um the demo that matt ran through today will be available uh we we believe later today as a blog post on our website so if you want to go through it more carefully um it'll be available there but thank you so much everybody yeah this is awesome